I'm glad that you're able to join me as we seek God's word and find in his perfect will how we as his people can finish this work in regards to getting the three angels message. So we're going to study God's plan, God's method of reaching the world with the three angels message. So before we begin this, I'd like to approach the great chief physician, the sovereign God. So if you can bow your heads while I kneel and seek God in prayer. Dear gracious Father in heaven, we come now in the lovely name of Jesus, the majesty of heaven, the sovereign God, as we open up your word to seek your divine plan for your people and hasten your coming and finishing this work. We ask that these presentations will not only be informational, but it be transformational and guide my thoughts, my words by the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. As we go through these studies, what you need is your great medical book, the Bible, pen and pad, and prayer, because we want to actually understand God's will and his divine plan and guiding his people in a finishing work. So if you're with me, if you're with me, I'd like you to open up your Bibles to the book of Matthew chapter 9 as we prepare for our discussion. Matthew chapter 9. We're going to pick up here at verse 35. As you turn those pages, Matthew chapter 9, verse 35. Let us read. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages. I want you to notice this. Teaching in their synagogue and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. Now, I want you to notice in verse 35, what do we see? We see Christ's threefold ministry in fulfilling his Father's will. Notice the first phase, teaching. The second, preaching. The third, healing. That was Christ's method of evangelizing. Teaching, preaching, and healing. Now, Christ is our great exemplar. Keep that in mind. He is the one that we need to model after. We need to study his life to become like him. We need to study his life to carry out the work as he has given us. Notice in verse 36. But when he saw the multitude, he was moved with compassion. Keep that in mind. On them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Verse 37. Then said he unto his disciples, the harvest truly is what? Plenteous. But the what? The laborers are few. See, there's not a problem for the demand, for the need, but there's a problem of providing the need. We need to supply the need. And so this type of work would never have a downside. When we follow God's method, we will always have a work to do until Jesus come. Notice what he said in verse, 40, verse 38. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will what? Send forth labors unto his harvest. So we see Christ's threefold ministry, teaching, preaching, and healing. We see that he was moved with compassion. That word compassion is to put yourself in the place of the one that has need. It's not only sympathy, but it's empathy. And to be moved with compassion, that means you are actuated, you are motivated to meet that need. But this is a great need. That's why Jesus said, the harvest is plenteous, but the labors are few. What God is looking for, my friends, are laborers type of laborers that will follow God's plan. And so what we're going to study now, as we're going to use the PowerPoint, and as you're going to notice what will be upon the screen, we're going to entitle this series of meeting, The Divine Prescription, Hope for Humanity. It's going to be in three-part series. So we're going to start with part one. Part one states, who is called? Let's get a brief introduction, then we'll move into the very question, answer the very question, who is called? So first of all, I'd like to establish something. There are three final great tests 
to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I want you to follow me. Three final great tests for the Seventh-day Adventist Church. So let's briefly look at those tests. The three tests. The first one is the Sabbath. Will that be a test? You know, the Bible says, remember the Sabbath day and what? Keep it holy. Exodus 28, verse 8. When you turn to your Bible and you'll read in Revelation chapter 14, verse 1 through 3, the Bible says, hold back the four winds until my servants are what? Sealed in their forehead. Isaiah 8, 4, 8 14 says, you know, talking about seal the law. Seal my, 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 my servants. The law, the testimony, the sealing. In Revelation 14, 1, John saw a group of people with their father's name written where? In their forehead. Name. We're going to see this in a moment. So bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples. Isaiah, sorry, 8, verse 16. Seal. We find what is that seal, that law, the Sabbath. As we go back on the screen, we find that seal within the Ten Commandments is the law of God. Keep that in mind. Very important. So here in Exodus 20, verse 8 through 11, you see what a seal consists of. The name, we find that it represents the creator, the territory. So the law, the seven-day Sabbath, contains the seal of the living God. Here is a statement from manuscript. Some might be familiar with this book, maybe not, but you have the video. You can always go over this over and over again. Manuscript 173, 1902. Notice what it says. It is not any seal or mark that can be seen, but a settling into the true, what? Both intellectually and spiritually. Follow me. So they cannot be moved. So as God's people step by step follow Jesus, they are being settled into the truth of God. And when the crisis come, they will not be moved. And so we find the three tests. So in Revelation chapter 13, we're going to see that the Sabbath is a test. Remember, Revelation chapter 13, when you will not be able to buy or sell unless you what? Have what? The mark of the beast. So we find the mark and the seal. We'll see that in the final days, there's going to be a law passed forcing people to violate their conscience in regards of a matter of worship. And most of us who are studying the word of God in prophecy, we realize that the Sabbath is a test in the last days. This is what's being controverted. The Sabbath will be a test. It will definitely separate us. Remember the Sabbath. That's the first test we're going to see. The Sabbath is a test to the church. Right now, it's not a test. When the crisis come, we're going to be faced with that test. What are we going to do? Many of us will give up the Sabbath for a piece of bread. We need to understand what it means to serve God, to be settled in to the truth. The next test would be the spirit of prophecy. In the book of 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 20, you read where, believe in the Lord your God, so what? Shall you be established? Keep that in mind. Then it goes on and says, believe his prophets, so shall ye what? Prosper. Now, remember Revelation chapter 12, verse 17, the two outstanding characteristics of the remnant church. What are they? You know that. It is commandment keepers, and they have what? The testimony of Jesus Christ, which Revelation 19 tells us it is the what? Spirit of prophecy. The gift of prophecy has been given to the church, and there will be a test, and their test is going on now. Many of us are giving up the testimonies. Notice what it says as I read this from third selected message, book three, selected message, page 84, paragraph three. Notice what it says. One thing is certain, those seven-day Adventists who take their stand under Satan's banner will what? First give up their what? Faith in the warnings and re reproofs contained in the testimonies of God's spirit. This is happening now. We are questioning the authority and the inspirational gifts that has been given to the church. This will be also a test to the church. Keep this in mind. So what's the first test? The Sabbath. The second test, the spirit of prophecy. Now let's go down to the third test. You say, well, you're going kind of far now. You tell me that the gospel medical missionary work is going to be a test? We find here in Matthew 25, 40, the Bible says, Jesus said, 
inasmuch you have done it unto what? One of the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. You're going to follow that as we read in Matthew 24. We talk about the faithful servant. We're going to find that there's only two classes of people, goats and sheep. We're going to realize that only servants will be sealed. Only servants motivated by the Spirit of God will walk on the sea of glass. We're going to see that the gospel medical missionary work will be a test. Notice what it says in a book called Councils on Health, page 506. Notice, read, really follow me as I read this. As religious aggression subverts the liberties of our nation, those who will stand for freedom of conscience will be placed in unfavorable position. It goes on. For their sake, they should. Notice this now. For their sake, they what? They should, while they have opportunity to do what? To become intelligent in regards to what? Disease, its causes, prevention, and what? Cure. Keep that in mind now. And those who do this will find a field of labor anywhere. This is the work that's going through to the end, ladies and gentlemen. There will be suffering ones, plenty of them who will need help, not only among those of our own faith, but largely among those who know not the truth. So here we are. Here's a question to you. In this writing, what are the four things that we need to know now in preparing for the finishing of this work according to the scripture? What are the four things? Notice what it says. What should we know? Number one, disease causes prevention and cure. When should we find this out? Now. We need to be preparing for now. Why? Let's go back. Let me go back for a moment. It says, as religious aggression subverts the liberties of our nation. What is this referring to? Religious aggression. Religious aggression subverts the liberty of our nation. Those who will stand for freedom of conscience will be placed where? In unfavorable positions. Therefore, this is dealing with the Sunday crisis. That means before that come, time comes, we need to understand gospel medical missionary work. We need to understand what is disease, the causes, the prevention, and cure. Why? Because we're going to see that this is the last work. This is the last work. Very important to understand that. Once again, what should we know? Number one, we should know what? Disease. Number two, causes. Number three, prevention. Number four, cure in these last days. Very important to understand this. As we move forward, I'd like to take us to the book of Revelation. Notice something here. In the book of Revelation, we find this angel flying in the midst of heaven. This is Revelation chapter 14, verse 6 and 7. Notice says, I saw another angel, what? Flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel. Now notice, I have on the screen here the word gospel medical, notice this, evangelism. Now notice in the center of that word, you see the word angel. Very important. This angel is flying in the midst of heaven. That means this is a movement of angel, but we understand as we study the word of God, this angel that John is referring to is not a literal angel. We find these are represented of people that God has chosen. You read that in the book of Revelation chapter one. Paul tells us in the book of Galatians chapter four, they receive him as an angel of God. So here's a people have an angelic message. So in the midst of evangelism is that angel. We find it. As we move on, the angel represents what? People. We find flying in the midst of heaven. The speed, the urgency. Do we have a sense of urgency of the times we're living in? Do we realize that we're on the brink of eternity? And God has a wonderful method that has ordained for us to help finish this work. We find heaven. It is a message ordained by God. Having, I want you to notice this. This word having within the English language means it's possessive. So here's a group of people, not just have a message in theory, but here are a group of people that are experiencing the power of the gospel. You remember in the book of Romans chapter 1, you can write it down, verse 16. The Bible says, Paul is speaking. I'm not what? Ashamed of the gospel, for it is the what? The power of God unto salvation. Keep this in mind. The gospel is what? It's the power of God unto salvation. When we understand the word salvation, we're going to see how medical missionary work fits into this. When we understand the word salvation, 
Matthew 1, 21. They should call his name Jesus. Why? Because he will save his people from sin. So the gospel is the power of God to deliver us from what? Sin. So here are a group of people experiencing deliverance from sin. Everlasting gospel from eternity past to eternity in the future. Keep this in mind. Turn with me to the book of Psalms 67 verse 2 as we see something very important in regards to salvation. In Psalm 67 2, the Bible says that thy way may be known upon earth. Notice this, thy saving health among what? All nations. Um, all nations. Keep this in mind. Psalm 67 2. Now notice this on the screen. Notice it. Health and salvation. There is an intimate relationship between health and salvation. Remember Jesus' threefold ministry? Teaching, preaching, and healing. Notice the relationship. When we look at this word, salvation, if we just take the A-T-I-O-N and put E on there, you end up with a word called salve. Now what do you do with this salve? It's an ointment. It's an ointment, rather, an ointment. Not an ointment, it's an ointment, and that is for healing. Now when we look at this word salve, it means to heal. So salvation really, even in Hebrew and Greek, it means to heal. So God is saying, I want my healing message to be made known to all nations. Healing on what level? Physical, mental, and spiritually. Healing all around the world. My saving health message, my healing message all around the world. That's why God tells us in Matthew 28, verse 18 to 20, he says, go. He didn't say sit. He said, go and carry this message to all the world. Carry this message to North America, South America, Europe, Africa, Asia, Australia, New Zealand, all over the world. Notice what it says in Matthew 24, 14. You should be familiar with this text. Notice what it says. The Bible says, and this gospel of the kingdom should be what? Preach in all the world for a witness to what? All what? Nation. And then shall the end come. We just saw in Revelation 14, verse 6, the everlasting gospel. So this gospel got to be preached. Now notice what it says. For a witness. What is a witness? Someone that heard of the experience on the news or secondhand? No. A witness is someone who had firsthand experience. So this gospel must be witnessed to the world. As we look on the screen here, here's a very profound statement. Evangelism is the heartbeat of the church. Notice what it says. Signs of the times. ST, signs of the times. December 20, 1899. The spiritual life of the church can be kept alive only as its members make personal efforts to do what? Win souls. You and I cannot spiritually thrive if we do not seek to win souls. It's like in the physical realm. If you don't use muscles, they atrophy. If you don't use your brain, it will be drained. Activity is a law of life. Keep this in mind. It's a law of life. So let us then come down to the point, the call to medical missionary work. Let's find out. What is this call? In ministry, in the ministry of healing, page 17, verse 2, I mean, paragraph 2, ministry of healing, wonderful book. You need to get this book, especially if you're interested in what's being said on the, in this series of messages. Ministry of Healing is a book that turned my life around over 40 years ago. When, I, when someone gave me that book, I did not know who and what the writer was all about. Then I found out the writer been a, a woman with less than a fourth grade education, had wrote this book, but not even being a Christian myself, when I picked up this book and began to compare it with the scripture, I came to the conclusion that this book had to be inspired. This is the book that changed my life. This is the book that motivates me, along with the word of God, to be carrying out gospel medical missionary work for the last 36 years. Very important. In this book, we find it says, that Christ, the very first paragraph, it says that Christ came as an unwearied servant 
to minister to man's necessities. Unweary servant. That's the type of life God's church has to experience. So who is called? Who is called? In these series of meetings, we're going to find out who is called in this presentation. The next presentation, we're going to talk about what is true gospel medical missionary work. And finally, how is gospel medical missionary work to be carried out? So let's establish, finally, based on our understanding that God has called his people to embrace this health message, this gospel medical missionary work, to give it to all the world. So find out, let's, who is called? Who is called? We're going to use the screen to identify. Once again, in the book, Ministry of Healing, write these down. If you have the book, pick it up, go get it, find it. If you don't have a book, we will make sure you get a book. Just contact us. We will make sure you get a book. In Ministry of Healing, page 395, paragraph one, notice what it says. True education is what? Missionary training. Every son and daughter of God is called to be what? A missionary. Now, unfortunately, we tend to narrow down the word missionary and define it as going to foreign countries, that's a missionary. A missionary is not defined by going to foreign countries or any country. It is defined as you have a mission. A mission. That mission is to carry the three angel message. It could be in your neighborhood. It could be on the college campus. It could be in your business. It could be right in your home. You're a missionary wherever you go. You don't have to travel around the world to be a missionary. Jesus did not really travel too far during his time of earthly ministry. Probably less than 300 miles radius. So we find here, missionary. Notice what it says. Again, Minister of Healing, page 148. To everyone who becomes a partaker of his grace, the Lord appoints a work for others. Individually, we are to stand in our lot and place, saying, as Isaiah said, Isaiah 6, Isaiah 6 here I am, send me. Keep this in mind. When you embrace Christ as your personal Savior, you, by your, your born-again experience, your second birth, you automatically become a missionary. If you're not doing missionary work, then you're not born again. <laughs> because remember, it's the Spirit of God that, what, imbues us, empowers us. And when Christ's Spirit is in me, I'm going to do the work of Christ. So there's no way a person can be in church for 30 years and not reaching out to help somebody. We become what we call spiritually constipated. If you understand that, physiologically, when the bowels don't move, it backs up. It creates a stagnant environment where bacteria grows and that breeds diseases. So if we are not laboring for souls, we are becoming spiritually constipated. We become a cesspool. And that influence permeates throughout the church, and thus creates spiritual disease, selfishness, jealousy, pride, envy. We don't want that. God has given us a work to do. Notice what it says. Upon the minister of the word. Notice this. The missionary nurse, the Christian physician, the individual Christian, people like you and I, whether it be merchant or farmer or professional what? Man or mechanic, the responsibility rests upon all. When we read this, this includes everybody. The maid, the janitor. You don't have to be degreed and ordained. You just need to have the grace of God. Notice what it says. It is our work to reveal to men the gospel of their salvation. Every enterprise in which we engage should be a means to this end. That means I'm not going to engage in any endeavor or business that's not going to promote the gospel. Of Jesus Christ. That is so important to understand that. God can, now notice this, gospel workers, page 488, 49, notice what it says. God can, what can he do? He can use those who have not had a thorough education in the schools of men. Did you hear that? Most people disqualify themselves because they say, well, I'm not learning. I don't have a degree. Well, I tell a person that you really need three degrees in order to, to do this work. You need three degrees. Some of, us might, some of us might know these degrees. The first degree is a B.A., born again. What do you think about that? If you're born again, then you have the first degree. 
MD, made in the divine image. You already have that because God breathed into this dust 6,000 years ago and created man in his image. And the third degree is a PhD. What is that? Praising him daily. Born again, made in the divine image, and praising him daily. That is your qualification. Notice what the Bible says through the, I mean, the spirit of prophecy says under the inspiration of God. It says, God can, God can and will use those who have not had a thorough education in the schools of man. A doubt of what? His power to do this. To doubt God can use anybody? Notice what it says. Is manifest unbelief. You look at yourself, your inabilities, the weakness, the frailty. But that in itself is it enough for God to manifest his power. He take the foolish things of this world to confound the wisdom of this world. Notice what it says. It is limiting the omnipotent power of the one with whom nothing is impossible. Oh, for less of this uncalled for distrustful caution. It leaves so many forces of the church unused. It closes up the way so that the Holy Spirit cannot use men. Because you've got to be qualified through degrees, through education. And I'm not knocking education if it is geared to preparing people to be God's instrument. It goes on and says here, it keeps in idleness those who are willing and anxious to labor in Christ's life. It discourages from entering the work many who will become efficient laborers together with God if they were given a fair chance. I hope that as you listen to these series presentation, that you will have a heart that is open for God to come in and move upon you to realize that you have been called for such a time as this as a solution to problems that God knew that was going to exist before you were born. That means you, each one of us, we are a solution to problems in this world that God knew was going to exist. That means if you and I do not align ourselves with God, that problem that exists in the heart of human beings may never be resolved of saw because you and I have failed to allow God to use us. You have a unique I have a unique part and role in helping to finish this work. Very important to understand this. Who is called? Now, please put this in memory hall, okay? This needs to be indelibly imprinted upon the mind. Volume 7 of the testimony, page 62. And I want you, as I read this, I want you to rehearse this in your own mind, especially the first two lines. Notice what it says. We have come to a time when what? Only nurses, doctors, hmm? No. It says we have come to a time when every member of the church should take hold of what? Medical missionary work. Please put that down. I hope you can put it in steel, in steel writing that it would not be moved because this is indelibly need to be imprinted upon your mind. Let's repeat this again in our mind. We are what? We have come to a time hmm, that what? Some know every member of the church should take hold of medical missionary work. Many people have read this, but somewhere down the line, it has been lost sight of. Every seven day Adventist should be a medical missionary. That's what it says. Every member, not some, every member. Notice what it says. The world is a laser house filled with victims of both what? Physical and spiritual disease. Medical missionary work is not only just geared to the physical, but it's geared to the whole person, to the spiritual. There are people under guilt and condemnation, rejection, abuse and misuse. And there might be someone here listening to me that has this answer to that person problem through the word of God, based on your experience. You must become a medical missionary. That's no option. Well, the option is, is to get out of Christ. But if you're in Christ, you've got to be a medical missionary. Notice what it says. Everywhere, 
everywhere, people are perishing for lack of what? The lack of a knowledge of the truths that have been committed to who? To us, the church. There are people who are, who are doing the best they know how to do, but they are ignorant of these truths that we have. We are blessed. That's what it says. It says the knowledge of the truths that have been committed to us, the members of the church, speaking to us now, the members of the church needs what? Of an awakening. We need to be revived and reformed that they might realize their responsibility to impart these truths. This is the purpose of these series of meetings, to arouse in you and to arouse in me the greater burden, the greater need that I need to become a tool in God's hand. And he has ordained a true method, gospel medical missionary work, that each one of us need to take hold of this work. I cannot overemphasize this. Please pray in your heart. Say, Lord, make me a gospel medical missionary. And we're going to see this as we go through this series. It is not something complicated. It's not complicated to understand this. So who is called? Who is called? God wants the ministers and the church members to do what? To take a decided, it didn't just say theory, theoretically. It says a decided what? Active what? Interest in the medical missionary work. It's not just for us to give a mental accent to it, but we need to be engaging in it. We're going to see how that's done. We're establishing here that every member, when we look at Luke chapter 10, you read the parable of the Good Samaritan. Luke chapter 10, verses 30 through 37. If you read the story, you might be familiar of the story where one of the church members fell amongst robbers and thieves and were left there to die. Left there to die. You know the story. First came a priest, and as he passed by, he saw him. He did not stop to do anything because he was had in a probably a church business appointment. He did not stop. He was so religious, the fact that he had to get to the church business meeting. Then came a Levi. You, first you had the priest, that's the pastor. Then you had the Levi, that's the elder. Because he was too engaged in his, also his own personal duties. These were church folk that by, bypassed the victim that was part of their own. But the Samaritan, a despised sect. So who was my neighbor? He stopped. But not only he stopped, but he began to perform true medical missionary. What did he do? He put oil and he bandaged his wounds. He ministered to the needs of that person. Not only that, he took out his own money to house him, and he said, whatever he need, I will pay. So he divested it of himself. He not only physically met the needs, he met the emotional and spiritual need of this person. This parable is true medical missionary work. But notice where the help came from. It came from outside of the church, unfortunately. I pray that we would not be found guilty of this. Every member should become a medical missionary. So as we come to a closure here, who is called? I think it's very clear that as you are trained, people from all over the world learning true medical missionary work, pictures of people who have the desire, young and old, they're being educated to go out into the world to pre preach the gospel. These are people being called from Asia, from all over, trained. Australia, trained. Even this dear lady that came to our training school some time ago, she had a, a very serious interest in working with people with AIDS in Africa. So she came to our facility to be trained to how to truly see people overcome AIDS. And she went into Africa where God really blessed her and then she moved on to another part of Africa in Kenya and started a home for children who have lost 
parents from AIDS, training in New Zealand, training in Austria, preparing folks, Australia, training, Germany, all over the world, Jamaica. These people are called. Thailand, training. You and I, we are called. We are called. Will you answer the Gospel American Missionary Call? This is my appeal to you. We want to go on in part two to understand what is medical missionary work. But at this point, we want to pause a moment. We're going to pray. You have seen very briefly that every member of the church is called to do medical missionary work. We have seen that the medical missionary work is part of the final test for God's people. We have seen that the gospel embraced the medical missionary work because we see the word salvation means to heal. God has blessed this church with a healing message. When you and I answer the call, will we be willing to say, Lord, here I am. Send me. I'm ready. You might, you might ask, you might be saying in your heart, I don't know what to do. Don't worry about that. God said, are, are you willing? First of all, are you willing? Where that first is a willing heart, God going to impart. So we're going to see how this is carried out. Do you want to answer the call? If that is your position, I want to pray with you. I want to pray that God will seal that in your heart, that you're going to respond to his call, that you are willing to take hold of gospel medical mission work. You are willing to be equipped, to be fitted to do this work. If that is your desire, I'd like for you to kneel with me in prayer as we ask God to put his seal of approval. Let us kneel, those who can. If you cannot, bow your heads, for God knows the heart. So let us pray. Loving Father in heaven, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your words, the Holy Bible and the spirit of prophecy that is clearly outlined to us the work that has been entrusted to your church. We have been called into existence to be a light bearer. We've been called to make known your healing message to all nations according to Psalm 67 verse 2. We have been called to take hold of true gospel medical missionary work. Every member and each person's father who has opened up their hearts to declare that they want to accept this call. At this time, I pray, put your seal of approval upon every heart. And now, Lord, fit us to fulfill this calling. In Jesus' name we pray and for his name's sake, amen.